people hated this scene and people loved this one. And it's the same scene essentially, it's a burn it all down moment, it's prompted by death, and despite other characters trying to stop it, despite it coming moments after a long sought after peace had finally been reached, it was kind of inevitable in hindsight. We should have known just by the character's name. And it wasn't just a disaster, it was this kind of twisted moment of personal triumph for these characters, despite it annihilating the show setting in this really shocking way. So why did this scene work and this one fail? And I want to narrow the scope of this video quite a bit. I don't think we need another video saying mostly the same stuff about the Danny scene. Yeah, it failed because they rushed her madness arc, we didn't believe the basis of this gigantic personality shift of hers, so the whole scene had no legs to stand on, felt incredibly unjustified for the character. They had like two episodes to set things up that should have taken at least one more season, probably two. And that's the part I do want to focus on. If they did have that extra season to do the progression right, what would it look like? And we're going to use our gal Jinx to figure that out. We're going to look into not just her arc, but the way she speaks, some of her mannerisms, how her madness is depicted by the animators, and we're going to get some help from a couple other buddies as well, Golly, Denny, Billy, Annie, and also some more help from a non-buddy, Dolphy. But madness is our topic today. What goes into a good madness arc? What goes into a good depiction of madness? What foundation is the burn it all down scene built on in an ideal story? And a more specific question that kept coming up with this topic is that there seems to be a big difference between mental distress and mental illness on the one hand, and madness on the other hand. Mental illness and distress are these things we see characters going through that we relate to with sympathy or empathy. And it's because we know mental distress. We've experienced mental illness ourselves or alongside family and friends, and we see fiction using these facets of our familiar world. Madness is not that way at all. Madness most of us don't know from real life, most of us know it from fiction. The mad scientist, the mad hermit, the mad king, the axe murderer. We see madness in stories and it doesn't evoke sympathy or empathy, it scares us. That stuff isn't resonating because, oh man, yeah, I've been through that. We relate to it as a horror archetype. It resonates like a werewolf resonates. It's just this horrifying thing to see depicted. Maybe there's some deep-seated fear of becoming that in some way, but it's not coming from our own experience. So it does seem like these things are different, but where is the line between these categories? What features bring inner conflict to that next level where we call it by this new name? Okay, so I want to get into methodology here, and something interesting we'll see once we explore Arcane's methods a bit is that Game of Thrones was trying really hard to do some of these. They didn't work, but they really tried. Okay, so I'll be honest here. I've been feeling like I've been missing something big when it comes to Jinx for a long time. Like this stuff. I've seen people call it Jinx's Scratching, great name for it. We see this, or I see this, and it does feel powerful. It feels like a great tool to depict inner chaos. But it was hard to say anything more than that. Just, yeah, it comes off as very mad, very wild, very demented. Felt like I was missing something. Same with this stuff and the dolls. All feels very much madnessy, but it felt like there's something more foundational going on here. Let me give you an example using something she says. Really thought I buried this place. But I should have known better. Nothing ever stays dead. Okay, so Jinx says a lot of weird stuff, but it's one thing when it's like throwaway lines and jokes, but stuff like nothing ever stays dead, that one sounds important, and it's like in the most important scene of the entire show, and it's not like we have no context here, there is a surface level understanding of what's going on. Jinx spent seven years thinking Vi was dead, and then all of a sudden, dead sister is back, dead sister is hugging her. And then there's a layer that goes a bit deeper here, we have Milo, unlike Vi, this was a sibling who was dead, but for Jinx, he didn't stay dead by any means. I mean, we hear her saying this about Vi. You never left, I always heard you. Shadows in the streets. There's even more left unsaid about the other sibling that was always there. And this extends to Vi as well when Jinx thought she was as dead as Milo. But for Jinx's tortured brain, Vi wasn't staying dead either. And then there's also like the more literary level that's also lurking here, or you could call it the psychological level, the subtext here. Old trauma, old conflicts, past events that should be firmly in the past should stay in the past so that you can move on. But they persist, they come back to haunt you, they resurface. The past will always have its claws in the present. So we can say all these things, but ultimately none of these answers were really satisfying to me. Which was weird because they're coherent, I guess. I can't point to something and say that doesn't make sense. They make decent sense, that's not the problem. But sometimes there's bad answers, and then sometimes the answers are okay, but there's a growing realization that you're asking the wrong question. That line, we can talk about what it means, we can get these ideas, but that's not getting to the core of what's going on here. It reminds me of this scene in Star Wars. Obi-Wan tells Luke that Vader murders his father. Luke finds out that's not true, and he feels kind of betrayed. So Obi-Wan gives him an explanation. Anakin turned to the dark side, and it's like the man he knew died. And that is an idea, but that's not what Luke was asking. The question that really opens up this whole situation is why did Obi-Wan purposely word it in this misleading way? And with that question, we get this wealth of context. Obi-Wan was charged with protecting Luke, which meant keeping his identity secret precisely so Vader would never find him. And of course, he realized rightly that Luke had this burning curiosity about his father, and he's trying to prevent that from actualizing in any way except learning the ways of the Force. And Obi-Wan knew that Luke looked up to this Jedi Knight version of his father, and that seemed healthy, and Obi-Wan didn't want to corrupt that. Or 
or worse, see that admiration for his father, the Jedi, turn into his admiration for his father, the Sith. That's a full explanation. That's satisfying to me. And that has nothing to do with what did his words mean. What we really wanted to know, the right question was what's causing him to express himself in this abnormal way. It's like the doctor in Arrested Development. How's my son? He's going to be all right. Oh, oh. thank God. He's lost his left hand, so he's going to be all right. You son of a Get bitch! Inside. I hate Most of the humor from that doesn't come from interpreting what his words mean. Most of the joke is that there's no reason at all for him to say it like that. So that's the real question here as well. And it's the question with so much of what Jinx says. Lines like this. Are we still sisters? Or like this. Powder fell down a well. We can understand pretty easily what she's saying. We can interpret. But what kind of person expresses herself this way? And what is this way? And you can't just say, oh, she's just saying it in a crazy way. That's my question. Crazy way. What does that mean? So what I realized all this was getting at was the question I had framed all this with, which is what is the difference between mental distress and madness? So I think the first big difference is externalizing conflict. And I think that term means something else in other contexts, but it's the most accurate description I could think of. So apologize for the awkwardness in phrasing. But anyway, so all of us experience conflict. Part of us wants X, part of us wants Y. But when that happens, we don't hallucinate a second self and have a dialogue with it. When we miss a loved one, we don't literally see them physically unexpectedly throughout our lives and then have to kill them because we're so freaked out. The way Jinx speaks, it's not about her saying how she feels, it's like statements about reality. Nothing ever stays dead. That is how reality works. I should have known better. Should have known. It's like she's learning about the world. And that other quote that I had before, powder fell down a well. Again, it's not a statement about her feelings. Her expression makes it like it's the statement of fact. It's not, no, I don't want to be called powder or no, I don't identify with that name anymore. No, powder fell down a well. It's like what happened in the world. That's how she's expressing her inner feeling about this. And this is also what's going on with the scratching. Mental distress is an internal phenomenon. Madness takes that internal conflict and creates an outer world from it that the character lives in. Lord of the Rings is excellent at this on so many levels, and in a completely different way than Arcane does it. Theoden, cursed with madness, isn't just depicted through his behavior and speech, it's externalized. And when he is cured of madness, that's externalized too. Gollum, we talked about this with the dual selves thing, which Arcane does do with Jinx, but his madness is also externalized in his physical appearance, just like Theoden. Madness is an outer transformation as well. It's a different kind of externalization, but similar impact on the audience. It's like the inner chaos bleeding out into reality. Even Midnight Express, where there's no CGI or anything, does this powerfully just with how Billy looks. And I'm guessing less of my audience is familiar with this one. It's based on the true story of an American who was sentenced to 30 years in a Turkish prison, and it's all about how this brutal environment deteriorates him. And just from the acting, we see such a physical change. The Star Wars prequels also do this with Anakin, not the greatest madness arc granted. Palpatine is a better example, I don't know if you would call it madness here though, but Arcane's way is so perfect because the scratching is so clearly this overflow from what's inside her head. It's reminiscent of her art style even. In typical Arcane, it really is expressed in everything about this character. Her madness isn't just this thing consuming the way she sees the world. It's not just something that impacts the way she expresses herself, it's shaped her living environment. It's in the company she keeps, so to speak. It's overflowed into her style of terrorism, which is all about creating these horrifying spaces and situations. It fits her style of invention, which always has taken the form of a smiling animal she can talk to even since she was powder, as if she's making imaginary friends for herself. And then obviously in the tea party scene, it's not just about her being theatrical and dramatic, it's her externalizing this conflict as it appears to her mind. The scene is bringing other characters in to Jinx world. Okay, so now three things about this externalized conflict idea. First thing is that it's not necessarily an entire alternate world the characters live in. It can be, but whatever form it takes, it must relate back to identity, to how the character sees himself. It's not a single person caught between worlds. It's one self that belongs to one world and the other self that belongs to the other world. And this will often take the form of two actual separate named characters, Powder and Jinx, Smeagol and Gollum, Anakin and Vader, but you can do it more subtly too, and I think Denethor is a great example of that. In one world, he's a pathetic King Standin watching his kingdom crumble, and in the other world, he is meeting his demise heroically like one of the heathen kings of old. And that heroic end isn't complete in its tragic glory if it's not the end of his house as well. So we get this externalization of him seeing Faramir as dead when he's not. That is a fitting end for this grand house of Gondor, which is integral to who Denethor is in this mad world of his. So here it's not an actual new identity, but still very much a world that relates back to identity in terms of how the character defines himself. Second thing, the way they relate to this alternate world is it's a source of conflict, and why wouldn't it be? Of course it is. These realities will overlap sometimes, but they'll create tons of contradictions on the important stuff. And it's a nightmare for these characters trying to reconcile those contradictions. It's not that they just sometimes happily move between the real world and the world of their delusions. Another reference that might be too obscure here, but in Arsenic and Old Lace, there's a character who believes he is Teddy Roosevelt, and he lives a complete and content life as Teddy Roosevelt. There's no tension, there's no agony of him trying to choose between these two worlds, these two identities. Nope, he's just Teddy Roosevelt. And that's not 
discrediting this character. That's how the character works and it works well. I'm just saying that is not this madness archetype we're talking about, even though there is a mad world here. For madness, we need a contentious relationship to this externalized delusion world. Gollum is tortured by this dilemma between his two selves, which self to be, and there's this give and take. Sometimes he's more Smeagol, sometimes he's more Gollum, and the ring does seem to universally create this exact kind of tension with its own brand of madness. The characters fall into its corruption and kind of start to take on different identities and then become aware of it and try to distance themselves, but it's this continuous battle. With Jinx, we really see that battle. She is constantly trying to get the voices to quiet down. Everyone shut up! I need to think. She's trying to tear herself away from what they're telling her. Even in those lines we talked about, again, it's not just nothing ever stays dead, it's the preface, I should have known. She's not just making an informational statement, she's judging herself for being dumb, basically. I should have known. We're seeing her caught in the process of trying to figure out which reality is real. And the third feature here also relates to an element within that nothing stays dead line. Think about what she's saying for a minute. Nothing stays dead. It's wrong, but it's not just wrong, it's the opposite of true. Nothing stays alive would be the more accurate version. Paradox is the feature to highlight here. That's what it means for these characters to exist in this intersection between the real world and the mad world. This statement in particular, just to draw the paradoxical side of it even more, Jinx's trauma goes back to these deaths in her past. The impact of the death for her is that they stay alive, that they never died, even though their deaths is the cause of her trauma. See this mad spiral it creates? That's the feeling we should try to capture with these mad characters. It's not just the evil of madness, it's not just the disconnect of madness, but the paradoxical world it forces on its victims. He hates and loves the ring. As he hates and loves himself. And we see this chilling duality over and over with Jinx. She drudges up the Valdiani, the traumatic item of her childhood guilt, but she puts sparklers around it like it's something to celebrate. She can't figure out if she cherishes Vi's bunny or hates what it represents, so she has two. She keeps one on her desk and she nails one to the wall. We have both. We're living in the contradiction. And her burn it all down moment, this destructive act, is representing this bizarre but powerful mix of Doomsday aesthetic with the red sky and the beautiful, triumphant shooting star aesthetic with the path of the missile. The madness isn't represented as total trauma or or total destruction or total hatred. It's celebrating trauma. It's beautiful doom. It's double bunny. Okay, so now where does this all take us? What do we do with it? So the climax of these arcs, when they're tragic, is absolute commitment to the mad world accomplished through some extreme act that only makes sense in that world. Burn it all down is a common way, but there are other forms this takes. So because of how extreme these climactic actions need to be, the conflict between these two realities has to take the form of reaching a boiling point. Meaning it's not just a steady agony that keeps popping up. Oh, there it is again. No, it's building and building, and the conflict makes the character try to quell it, try to stop it, try to tie themselves down to the real world by force that they stay there. Wolf, now and never come back! But that repression only makes it worse, and it keeps just building and building more and more corrupt, stronger and stronger externalizations, more and more transformative, so that this climax action isn't just a decision, it's a damn breaking moment. And that's partially what ends up justifying it on our side, on the audience side, because these actions are typically so extreme that even if there's a reason for it generally, it is hard to believe a character is making a conscious decision to do something so insane. But if there's years of pressure building up, years of repressed emotional energy pushing the character to act over and over, and the character refusing each time or never quite letting themselves go 100%, then we have that justifying the action as well. Of course that much pent-up energy needs to find release in something that extreme. Okay, now to shift gears a bit, let's talk about uh, Hitler. The next element of madness is expressed so perfectly in this book, I'll show it here. So this author makes documentary, so listen to this, this happened in 1990. When writing and producing a film about Dr. Joseph Goebbels, I talked to Wilfred von Oven, who has his personal attaché, and worked closely with the infamous Nazi propaganda minister. After the formal interview over a cup of tea, I asked this intelligent and charming man, if you could sum up your experience of the Third Reich in just one word, what would it be? As Herr von Oven thought for a moment and considered the question, I guess his response would make reference to the horrible crimes of the regime, crimes he freely admitted had occurred, and of the damage that Nazism had wreaked upon the world. Well, he finally said, if I was asked to sum up my experience of the Third Reich in one word, that word would be paradise. We tend to view human horrors like Nazism from how we know it to be, in our perspective. But from the perpetrator's perspective, it can take on an entirely different character. We know this movement was like the incarnation of evil itself, but that doesn't mean that what was driving it were these cartoonishly evil villains stroking cats talking about creating a world of pain and death and evil. No, what drives this kind of madness can be hope. It can be paradise. Crazy as it sounds, it can be a desire to make the world a better place. And yeah, completely corrupted, completely insane, but at its root, it's often a blinding positivity at the heart of madness. I remember standing there for hours basking in the radiance of the funeral. But now that just seems like a dream. A strange, wonderful, frightening dream. It was not a dream. It was a nightmare. 
of our own making, and it's time to wake up from it. The look in Hitler's eyes was not radiance. It was madness. So back to fiction, that aspect of madness, the positivity, even if it's not something we typically choose to highlight in real life madness, that is a very resonant factor in depicting madness in stories. These moments for us may be horrifying, but for the characters, letting that dam finally burst and giving in to the alternate world, it's triumph, it's destiny, it's bliss. Depicting that distance, that disconnect between the positivity within the doer and the actual objective evil or destructiveness, through the perspective of the onlookers, us included, that disconnect is so powerful. It really transforms the impact from shocking to horrifying. Okay, so now we have our positivity, we also have our buildup of conflict. That dam breaking moment we talked about earlier usually has one more major ingredient, grief. And this is in the same vein of what we talked about earlier with justifying that moment, making us buy that the character would actually do something that extreme, that out of reality. Grief is another way of aiding that justification. The character faces an unexpected death of a loved one or an unexpected defeat or failure. Everything until now the dam could hold. And we've gotten a sense of what this dam is capable of holding. So whatever breaks it has to be worse. It has to be a qualitatively harder blow than anything we've seen up until now. With Jinx, it was seeing history repeat itself, killing her family again. It was the loss of her most cherished bond, which was also one of her final remaining bonds. So we need the character's world shattered. That's a prompt for action. The character needs to fix their world, or to get back at the world for what it did to me. Either way, we demand an action whose impact will be as loud, as bad as what impacted me negatively. And that's where the bliss fits in, the triumph, the positivity. The character's now desperate on a whole nother level to escape from grief, or to revive a cherished bond, or to balance the scales of how fate treated them or of justice. The lure of the positivity within their madness has never been stronger. That positivity is what will balance the scales. And while we're on the topic of the grief trigger for the dam breaking moment, similar to this is the trigger of the madness arc as a whole, like going back much earlier in the character's life or in their arc, and this usually does need its own trigger. Not everyone goes mad, so we feel like there should be some event we can point to which sets the character down this path. Often it's an event of the same nature, some world shattering trauma, death, loss, defeat, but it can also be the introduction of some dark influence. A dark person, a dark object, a dark substance. It can be an environment, like the prison in Midnight Express. It can be an idea, either independent or an interpretation of an event, often related to identity. She jinxes every job! With Denethor, it seems like the general trigger was Boromir's death, and then the final trigger was Faramir's death, in quotes. The Star Wars prequels actually turn it on its head, making love the inception point of Anakin's Madness arc. Very interesting, they don't do a very good job, but it's a very interesting idea. Okay, next main ingredient. This one is a little hard to articulate, I'm gonna borrow a friend's definition here. I'm calling this spiritual deterioration. And this is my friend Abby's definition of spirituality, which doesn't really have to do with spirits or God or religion. My friend Abby is a chaplain at a children's hospital. She helps a lot of parents and children facing devastating illnesses, and her definition of spiritual spirituality is connection. And there's five levels of connection she focuses on with the people she works with. Your connection to your community, your connection to your family, your connection to yourself, connection with your body, and connection with something greater. Whether it's a cause, a value, a mission, God, whatever it is. And I think these provide an interesting model that encompasses the kind of deterioration we see with madness. We feel like relationships with the people around us, our societies, our families, that's what keeps us grounded so we don't find ourselves slipping into these worlds that don't make sense to anyone around us. And that's it, it also goes both ways, that this descent into into madness also does end up wreaking havoc on relationships. And this breeds a characteristic almost universally associated with mad people, a paranoia. This is what these broken relationships become. I'm not connected to any of these people, they are against me. If you're not with me, then you're my enemy. Oh, shudder. Again, I love Lord of the Rings' depiction of this from both ends of the spectrum. Gollum obviously cast out from his own society and then actually alone for 500 whatever years. And even when he forms relationships, his paranoia fights to break them. But also Denethor isolated in his own way at the top of society. I don't think this was in the books, but in the movies they express it beautifully in the visuals. This giant empty throne room. And of course his Man of Stark matches up with his isolation from his family. And Saruman similar with his ivory tower or ebony tower isolation. So this type of deterioration doesn't have to be this icky, dirty, the outcast thing, it can take a variety of forms. And then we have isolation from the self equally important here, which in a lot of ways means that it feels like we don't know the person anymore. But it's not just a change of personality shift, it's like the person we remember is deteriorating. We see the reprieve from the moments of madness, the resurfacing moments. Sometimes we see it depicted almost as if the character had an out of body experience and then has like an abrupt return to the self. And I think this encompasses the disconnection from self, from identity, but also disconnection from something greater. Disconnection from your values, your mission, your life 
life's devotion. But the disconnection from body, that's a really interesting category here. And the word that might fit better for this concept here is humanity. Disconnection from humanity or deterioration of your own humanity. I talked about this a bit in the Gollum short that I did. The character becomes less human. Their human characteristics diminish, speech becomes limited, they start acting like animals, eating like animals, or they might become more corpse-like. And that's another way of expressing this, mindlessness, vacant affects, meaningless behavior, emptiness. With Jinx, we obviously have her becoming more and more socially isolated. We have her burn it down moment coming after all of her relationships are no more. But my favorite depiction of this, of the isolation of identity in particular, is the stuff they do with a mirror. She can't see her reflection. She tries to connect to herself by looking in the mirror, but that connection is shattered. And I think Arcane deals a lot with disconnection from your body, with everything they do relating to monsters and shimmer, changing your nature, changing your very substance. With Jinx, we do see this little part of her arc that has to do with her body, and with how her madness affects how she values her body and ultimately impacts what her body is. We see this lead to this transformation physically for her, in the subtleties of how she looks and how she even moves. So all these elements I used to see as kind of separate, but I think this umbrella term, this way of thinking about it as spiritual deterioration, fits really well to encompass all of these qualities. Okay, final ingredient here is agency. And there's also a feature of fictional madness. Doesn't seem like a real thing with real madness. But the madness arc doesn't feel complete until the characters themselves get to that crucial moment of choice and choose madness. And I think this also has to do more with our relationship to the character via the other characters in the story. Madness arcs are often about trying to bring the person back from the brink of madness. There's faith that they can see reason they can be themselves again. And as long as we hold on to that hope that it's something we can save them from, we cannot get to a resolution. So that hope has to die. And it dies with the character showing that they want this. When they have the opportunity and the freedom to choose otherwise, to choose reality, they make the wrong choice. And of course with Jinx we get that quiet, incredible moment of her sitting in the Jinx chair. No voice is telling her to, no demons, nothing to push her either way, and she herself makes that choice to be Jinx. And that's when we finally lose all hope. Okay, so that's what I got for Madness. So let's go back to Game of Thrones and see what we're dealing with here. So what's interesting, like I mentioned before, is that we do see them trying to do some of these. And there were problems that came out extremely half-baked. So let's start with that. Let's expose some of these doughy, mushy, unbaked globs and Danny's half-baked Madness arc. And half-bakedness is its own type of problem, which is what happened with most of these. Lack of development, lack of time to develop. But really what we'll see is a lack of a strong foundation upon which to develop. But before we get to that, there's one here that was just raw, not half-baked, just a bad choice. One of the most obvious problems I've seen other people point out here, the grief trigger. They tried to do this, Missande dies, and that's supposedly what pushes Danny over the edge. It's the straw that breaks the camel's back, and I think within that very idiom, which undoubtedly was thrown about the writer's room to describe this very moment, we can see why this failed. And all camel farmers watching, please correct me on this if I'm wrong, but what usually breaks camel's backs is not individual pieces of straw. Usually camel backs are broken by like, I don't know, really bad falls, down dunes, or like cars, or sandworms, I don't know. The whole reason that straw that breaks the camel's back is an idiom, the whole reason it sounds interesting is because despite it being possible, the alternative seems much more realistic to us. Straws don't actually break camel's backs. It's the irony, it's how unlikely it would seem. And to put that in the terms we discussed earlier, the way the dam breaking moment works is that we get a buildup of challenges and burdens, and through those we get a sense of what this dam can hold, which denotes an expectation of what it will take to break it. And whatever form that takes, it has to be world shattering, it has to be so bad, so big, that the equally big response it prompts is understandable to us, meaning that climax action. So it's going to be so bad that only burning it all down is going to balance those scales. And in Game of Thrones, they had that. We saw two dragons die, and that would have been a great opportunity. And forget how this would fit into the mess of the Beyond the Wall plot, but imagine Danny goes to warn King's Landing, and that's when we see the Scorpions for the first time, and in horrifying succession, they kill Viserion and kill Rhaegal, and it's the first time we see dragons die. And we also want to balance the scales of this injustice. So Danny lays waste to the Scorpions and can't stop herself from balancing the scales by destroying King's Landing as well, killing the children of Westeros in retribution for killing her children. That would have been better, but what did we get? We got dead dragons, and then we're like, oh, they killed her dragons, and she hasn't gone mad yet. That's a pretty strong dam. And then Missandei is what sets her over the edge? Terrible sequencing. And half of it was clearly from failing to juggle these two major plot lines and their climaxes, but the other half was just running out of characters. Which, as I mentioned in the Stranger Things death video, is exactly what happens when your show's gimmick is killing off characters. They walk right into that one. Okay, so that grief trigger, that's one thing we're gonna need to fix. While we're on the topic of the dam breaking moment, we don't get a build up either. And this one was a time issue. They had moments like this Do not become what you have always struggled to defeat. We can tell she's suppressing emotion, but we didn't get anywhere near a boiling point. So we're gonna have to figure out what that looks like also. Positivity, they also tried to do. She knows what's good and no one can tell her otherwise. She wants to build the society of peace. She's gonna free the world from tyrants. And there's her paradox as well. She wants to free them from tyrants, but she's the tyrant. Oh no, it makes no sense. Why can't she see? But let's, let's 
let's discuss the contradiction. Spiritual deterioration, we do have some of this, and by some I mean basically just this. She hasn't seen anyone since we returned, hasn't left her chambers. Her relationships do get rocky, but it doesn't feel like isolation, it just feels like normal conflict. Same kind we've seen all series long. We see some deterioration of humanity, and I'm being like a thousand percent generous here. Hasn't accepted any food. She looks a little worn too, but yeah, nothing besides that. The general trigger, the inception point of the whole madness arc, they think they gave this to us, but I don't think they did. It seems like they're trying to say the root cause of the madness is blood, which is a big theme in the show, so that helps a bit. We get a history of mad Targaryens and then this. They say every time a Targaryen is born, the gods toss a coin and the world holds its breath. So you're telling me that the root cause of the madness arc is randomness? That's not a cause, it's a lack of a cause. And I get what they're going for here. It's suspenseful if we don't know what tips the scales, but it's not satisfying to have a vital part of an arc have no cause. Just like it wouldn't be satisfying to say, here's Aragorn, whether he becomes king is a flip of the coin. Not his character, not his struggles, just randomness, statistics. And lastly, they do give us a moment of agency, a moment of choice. And like I said before, they do it just the same way Arcane does it. All the plot reasons to act fall away because we have peace. And it's actually slightly stronger here because Danny knows for sure that this means peace and doesn't show any signs of not trusting it, where Jinx doesn't know if there's peace or not, she's still overcome with her paranoia. So the bells ring, Game of Thrones also uses quiet and stillness to emphasize the lack of other influences on Danny's decision, just like with Jinx, and Danny chooses madness just like Jinx does. Very similar. So this is the part where I'd say, they did this part fine, it just has no foundation to stand on, so it fails because of everything they failed to do beforehand. If you imagine them doing everything right and then the scene is the exact same, easy to imagine it being a great scene. So that's everything they tried to do and it didn't work, so we have half-baked versions of these rules, and then the parts of what we talked about that they didn't even touch, we have these. Externalized conflicts, second identity and conflicting realities, and those three really are the most important. They are the foundation to build the entire arc on. Danny kind of started to act not like herself by the last episode especially, but not like herself didn't mean a second identity. This was not Smeagol reverting to Gollum. It was not Powder reverting to Jinx. It wasn't even Denthor LARPing being a heathen king of old, it was just Danny being out of character. We badly needed a second identity of some kind, but they didn't give us one. When she talked about the world she wanted to build, it wasn't a world we were really familiar with. It should have been part of her externalized conflicts. We should have been building a world where this action made perfect sense in its own twisted paradoxical way, but in a way where we really could relate to the peace of it, the triumph of it. Having those two worlds, having Danny be tortured by it constantly as she tries to work through all these plot burdens, sometimes she's moving away from reality, sometimes she's moving towards it, that's what we needed and what we didn't get. What they tried to do was that she wanted to be loved, but she was feared, but that's not an identity. And the thing is, we had identity she should have been conflicted over, we should have seen the clear deterioration underway of her becoming just another mad Targaryen, and then also feel her longing as Danny to become a good queen. She should have been tortured by the question of whether she was going to be one of the mad Targaryens or one of the sane ones, that creates something that can build up, something that can break a dam. Without that, we don't have much that we can build up. She just wants to be loved because I guess everyone wants to be loved. And she wants to be a queen because that's the name of the show. And everything that happens, the deaths, the war, it doesn't build on any of that. These events don't push her to want to be loved more, to want to be queen more. No, it just doesn't relate to the Madness arc at all. Okay, so time for the fix. And to be clear, this video is about Madness specifically. I'm interested in developing solutions to just that aspect. I'd be lying to myself if I thought I could fix the finale as a whole or the show as a whole, like with all the plot lines and everything. Thing. Too much, not smart enough, happy to let someone else make that video. So here I'm just gonna throw out like 10 or 12 ideas for fixing Danny's madness arc on its own, and then I'm gonna call it a night. So before we discuss identities or anything like that, it starts with a trigger. She needs a crossing of the threshold moment, like Deagle's murder, like Boromir's death, Billy's imprisonment, powder killing her family, something that traumatizes her, isolates her, and gives her story space to dream up mad worlds and mad identities. So let me just shoot out about six possibilities here that will mostly accomplish the same thing, we'll discuss the differences. Number one, one of Danny's dragons is killed while she's on it, and we get the trauma of the first dragon death along with severe injury to Danny from the fall. Two, she kills the Ice King and his dragon with hers, but his final attack freezes her so severely with some dark Night Kingy magical ice that it's his curse lingering on that ends up torturing her, like Frodo's Weathertop injury. Not only do we have Night King magic corrupting her, but the abomination that is a fire and blood Targaryen being frozen. Three, similar effect is two, she's captured and tortured by the Night King for a prolonged period of time. Four, she is tricked into killing one of her own dragons, very powder-like trauma of being haunted by this worst sin of hers. Maybe her own dragons turn on her as a result of this, and she has to be increasingly cruel to them to get them in line, and that itself drives her madness even further. Five, she finds out about John's lineage, embraces him as a family member, her only one left, family, it's the strongest bond ever, and then for political reasons he betrays her and she's left truly alone, or nearly alone this time. Six, she and John fall in love, get together, and despite being told she can never have children, she miraculously conceives again, and then either miscarries again, or whatever is growing in her is even more of an abomination than last time, and her madness increases as this evil air that should not be grows inside of her. Okay, so again, all 
both of these provide trauma that can build. And also they provide a practical reason for Denny to become isolated. She becomes isolated because she needs to heal from her battle wounds or because she's pregnant or because she's recovering from her miscarriage. Or she becomes isolated in captivity. Or she becomes isolated in prolonged grief after her first dragon dies. Or she's betrayed and actually is isolated by her allies. And during this period of isolation, we get the chance for her to start externally manifesting her conflicts. And let's pause here because there's another shortcoming here that had so much potential. The topic is historical inspiration. So I've seen how people point out in this scene we get a very on-the-nose visual parallel to the Nazi rallies in Nuremberg, and I love drawing on history for creative stuff, but there's a way to do it. If you just have Danny do rallies and have flags and make her unsullied wear dragon armbands and goose step and say Heil Danny, it comes off as lazy. It's like, I don't want to think up interesting villain stuff, let's just copy and paste from the most obvious villain in history. Laziness to the degree that is that noticeable is distracting and it breaks immersion. That's the biggest problem, but a subtler problem here is that there's nothing inherently evil about these things. It's not like goose stepping or holding big rallies is actually an expression of just how evil this movement was. So you're borrowing the wrong stuff, it's just trying to create the superimposed association to evil from our own world. And it's a shame because there are elements they could have drawn on from Hitler and his movement that absolutely express exactly the kind of evil identity they were building for Danny. Let me give you two perfect examples if you'll permit me to dip into history a bit again. The Colosseum in Rome held about 50,000 people. Pretty crazy if you think about the world population back then. Cut to modern times, biggest stadium in the US is the Michigan Stadium, holds 107,000 people. Twice the Colosseum, over 100,000 people in one place. And then current biggest stadium in the world, India with the Narendra Modi Stadium, capacity of 132,000, crazy number. Okay, so if you go to Nuremberg today, you can see the foundations of the Grand Stadium commissioned by Adolf Hitler. According to Hitler's plans, the Deutsche Stadium's capacity was, are you ready for it? Over 400,000 people. That's eight Colosseums. This was a stadium he saw serving his world Nazi empire. Near the stadium is the Nazi parade grounds. It's about two miles long, wide as a 10 lane highway, and it's made not of asphalt like a normal road, not of cement, it's made of granite. It's made out of a stone that would last thousands of years because in Hitler's delusional dreams of his eternal Reich, Nazis would be marching upon it in their glorious parades for thousands of years. And these delusional dreams of Hitler's were externalized physically into the city of Nuremberg. The stuff is still there. You can walk on the Granite Nazi Road. You can see the construction site of the stadium along with shells of other delusionally enormous building projects in various states of construction and deconstruction like the Zeppelin Fields and the Grand Congress Hall that's so big they don't even know what to do with it nowadays. You can go to Germany today and reach out and touch Hitler's madness. So Danny wanted to create a world empire very similar to this. Instead of telling us these characteristics of Danny's mad delusional dream world, lack of wars, lack of certain political realities, too abstract I can't picture that, show us her world. Show us plans for the capital of her empire with like a castle of 10,000 rooms. Viserion and Rhaegal are dead, have her plan colossi of them that will dwarf the titan of Bravos. This is the type of thing that can very easily and vividly externalize itself. We see her dreaming of this as she's in captivity being tortured and fever dreams while recovering from her injuries. We see her waking up in dreams of her grand city, walking through the streets, feeling the grandeur, becoming more and more driven to convey it to her most loyal followers, bring it into reality. We see her ordering craftsmen to create city models that cover her entire throne room. We see her actually begin to build the foundations. Let's say there is a Westerosi city that declares for her, and she orders the entire city demolished to clear room for her grand imperial palace. And we get these scenic shots of city-length foundations for a single building. And maybe later we learn that she had the people all killed because she'll have no Westerosi sullying her heavenly royal city. So all of this feeds really well into one track that they already had in place, half-baked, but it was there, this tyrant to end all tyrants thing. And this would be making concrete her vision of her queendom, this version of what she wants to build that we can see. Her attachment to that vision, anything she does because of it, becomes more believable because we see her building it. So that fits that. But but there's also another half-baked track they had, which also had tons of potential, which was the Targaryen angle. We already have this very vivid, fully functional version of literally everything I'm talking about in this video, both the rules and some of the possibilities we just suggested. They had that with Mad King Ares. With him, the madness had already begun, but we get the story of him being captured and enduring torturous months in captivity, and thus began his mad fixation on cruel punishments, most specifically burning people alive. He develops this fascination with wildfire, and he starts raving all these fire, dragon-related things, and that is the other path to take Danny. General Targaryen dragon fire theme things. The burning people alive thing, even if it is the same as her dad, I think that path would work just fine. First it's people who deserve it for not bending the knee or for betraying her, and then becomes a crazy obsession on its own. She starts demanding to see people of less and less guilt, so to speak, being burned. She sees herself as purifying Westeros, something extreme like that. And watching these burnings are these intensely satisfying experiences for her. I think that much alone would do so much for the arc. Or, going back to the isolation scenarios from before, maybe in grief for her dragon, she wants images of dragons, bones of dragons, dragon scales constantly around her, 
her, close to her to ease her grief. Maybe she starts dressing in dragon scales, maybe even the actual scares of her own dead dragon. We get some good deterioration of humanity going. Maybe as she's recovering from her Night King's cursed icy injuries, she demands enormous fiery braziers brought into her room next to her bed, making her room impossibly hot. Maybe she starts referring to herself instead of as Mother of Dragons as the Dragon Mother, and suddenly we're starting to be reminded of her mad brother. And now you've woken the dragon. We hear her using that phrase and we're like, oh. or that's too cheesy too on the nose or whatever, a less intense option that's equally tied to lore. As she's recovering from her injuries or her failure or betrayal, she turns to her ancestors for wisdom. She becomes obsessed with Targaryen history. And all these historical facts of the Mad Kings and the Targaryens which she thought would horrify her, she's entranced by it. She begins to idolize figures like her own father. The determination to be that ruthless and maintaining order. She relates to that as her own plans crumble. She sees that as heroic. And we see her withdraw from her actual relationships and devoting more and more to this bond with her dead father, who she feels like she's bonding with in this irrational way by letting his mad ways guide her. Maybe we even go the jinx route and have her make a life-size idol of him she demands her subjects bend the knee to, especially those connected with Robert's rebellion, undo their betrayal by swearing to their true king. And if you want to take it a step further, you could have her exhume her father's remains, do like a fully-fledged Lenin, or just a bone of his or ashes of him becomes this precious object, or she erects a shrine of some kind. And obviously you can take it further in the classic way, you could have her start to hear her father's voice in her head thinking he's guiding her personally. Okay, and now with all of this, maybe we have enough to start combining some parts of this together, up the epicness levels a bit. Across the narrow sea we have Valyria, the ancient capital of a super powerful empire full of all kinds of lost magic and technology, completely destroyed by some natural disaster, seemingly Pompeii-like, and Targaryens are the blood of old Valyria. So combine Danny being obsessed with her ancestors and Danny having fever dreams of her grand capital city and what do we get? We have Danny dreaming of rebuilding the old empire of her bloodline. She doesn't just want to win the Iron Throne, she wants to level all of King's Landing and establish new Valyria in its place. A kingdom so powerful it harkens back to the strength of ancient empires of legend. And we get this growing fantasy for her literally wiping out all memory of Westeros' seat of royalty and its people from history so she can have this dream empire of hers. And you go further with the voices here, hearing the voices of her ancestors, you could ever hear hundreds of voices, thousands, the ghosts of old Valyria entreating her to rebuild. Okay, now this is all the mad world, mad identity part of things, but remember, it's the conflict that really make these madness arcs work. I love the idea of this three-prong setup. Cersei is getting more and more evil, which is how things do play out in the show as it is. But for her, it's not madness. It's her becoming crueler, more ruthless, more corrupt. Then we have Danny's following, which is actually becoming more and more good. We see this trickling towards her of all the individual characters who are pretty moral, pretty wise, good leaders, noble knights, loyal characters, admirable characters, cool characters. And then we have Danny herself, who all the previously mentioned goodies are behind. She is what unites them. They want to put her on the throne. But the closer and closer they get to victory, the madder their queen becomes. And I'm using Jinx's role in Arcane as the basis here too. We have the good guys, the bad guys, but it all comes down to this one character and whether or not she chooses sanity or madness. And there's this real effort by her side to keep her sane. There's this confusion and disagreement about whether to stay loyal to her. And there's this tragic realization on Danny's own part that she is going mad. Or at least a realization of the possibility that she's mad. Uncertainty about this vision of hers or this identity of hers. And we see this determination of hers to be a good queen. A leader worthy of followers like Jon Snow or Jorah or Tyrion. She wants their validation but she also feels burdened by it, frustrated by their inability to see her vision. Inability to understand her behavior, her grief, her pain. Inability to understand her admiration for her Targaryen ancestors. And we see this waver between frustration and outright resentment. Maybe we even get fury at sometimes. This is what she starts to see as betrayal. Her followers not understanding her. And with the paradox theme we have her fearing all these various forms of madness but also running towards the madness when she craves its sense of empowerment. Or if it's this identity she's taking on this dragon self. It inspires her and scares her. In these visions of new Valyria for her she's caught between its grandness and also visions of another doom. If we do the pregnant thing maybe she fears what's inside of her but also loves it. Maybe she grows paranoid of it, jealous of it. Okay so what about the final trigger, the grief trigger? What shatters Danny's world and breaks her dam. So I still do think that far and away the best option would be to kill dragons. Best of the best would be if we first see dragons killed here. Rhaegal and Viserion both get killed by the scorpions. Danny goes nuts on Drogon. But even if we have one or two of them dead before this, I think coming to King's Landing on Drogon, and then Drogon getting shot and wounded badly, and then in panic and fury and desperation and grief, Danny lays waste to King's Landing on a dying Drogon. I think that also works. We and Danny both think Drogon is dying, and this determination that we have to win before we lose Drogon. That's what makes her turn him loose completely not caring who or what she destroys. And then after the battle you could have him survive and now we have a Danny who is empowered by the experience of unleashing hell like that and then from there it would be the same progression as the current finale. Danny wants more power, wants to burn everyone, John has to kill her and if it's not dead dragons that send her over the edge, next best option would be everyone betraying her which is also something they tried to do but we could do it so much more strongly. If we do have this progression of her getting madder as her good people following gets closer to victory we have them reach a breaking point with her, they turn on her and bend the knee to John, the other Targaryen. Daenerys escapes on Drogon 
and now unfettered by all these weak advisors, she does what she's been dreaming of doing up until now, and we burn. If we do the Grand City thing and she's already started building anything, that could also be the dam breaker. She's building a city, Danny destroys it, and Danny has to destroy King's Landing in retaliation. She's building a Colossus, it gets toppled. She's building statues of Targaryen ancestors for people to bow to, they get destroyed. Danny retaliates with her own worst destruction. That all works, I think. If we do the option of her being pregnant, I think miscarriage or having the baby be born and then someone kills it, totally reasonable dam breaker for her. Even more horrifying, have Danny kill it in her madness, have her burn it. That would be the worst and most perfect. And probably the most straightforward option considering we have two more seasons. Make a character like Miss Sunday actually become a super close confidant for her and then die. We have time for that now, it could work. And you can do it with a lot of characters, have Tyrion become her most trusted advisor, the one who stands by her, the one who keeps her sane and we kill him. Jorah keeps being ultimate simp number one, he stands by her and we kill him. Grey Worm you could probably theoretically do. Jon Snow I think needs to stay alive, but lots of options, lots of relationships to work with. Go all in on one of them and then kill that person. Totally valid dam breaker. Okay, that's it. I think I'm done. Agency moment is fine. Keep the bells. It works. And again, I'm not trying to fix the rest of what's wrong with season eight. None of this has to do with fixing, for example, the decision to make Bran King, which I thought was by far the dumbest moment of the finale. And so much of what I'm proposing totally isn't really Game of Thrones style. Even the World War II stuff, that's not what the series tends to do. George Martin is bound to do some fascinating type of madness drawn from medieval history. And also, by the way, it is hard to do madness in a show that has had eight seasons of no madness. At that point, the audience is used to characters acting somewhat rationally. They're not used to outrageous behavior. They're not used to delusions. They're not used to voices. They're used to smarts and cleverness and ruthless pragmatism and all that political drama stuff. With madness, there's this risk that if it's too much, even by a little bit, it's totally cheesy and not believable and stupid and breaks immersion. And if it's not enough, even by a little bit, it's out of character and it's random and it's not believable and stupid and breaks immersion. Very little wiggle room to work with here. So if your criticism of anything I'm suggesting is that it's going too far, I hear that totally valid. But that's not the point of the video. This is about learning more about madness and using Game of Thrones as raw material for an exercise. And I highly recommend this type of exercise exercise any writers out here listening to this. Find a story that does something really well, induce methods and rules, try your best to apply those methods and rules to a story that fails to do that same thing. And that will usually involve new interesting angles of diagnosing the problems now that you're coming at it with the new stuff you've learned. And then you can adapt all these lessons, think of a bunch of new ways of going and see how they play out. How will things actually turn out in Game of Thrones? I'm absolutely sure George Martin will have a fantastic madness arc full of new tidbits to learn, new methods, new rules, etc. I guess we'll see in the next 40 to 50 years. So we hit 100,000 subscribers, which is unbelievable. I started making our Arcane videos in mid-November of last year, so it's just over eight months, I think. This has been so insane. I've always liked thinking about this stuff on my own, but I never imagined this kind of response. It's really humbling, and I'm really grateful. Thanks to everyone who watches, subscribed or not subscribed. I'm just happy you stopped by to watch and share the ideas and participate in the discussion. Thanks to the patrons, as always. And as a last note here, if you'll indulge me a bit, I'd like to dedicate this video in the event of reaching 100k to one of my main teachers who passed away just a couple months ago. He really laid the foundations for me with analysis in general. I talked about this in the q and I did for 50k, but I have a background in a much different kind of analysis, and I bring a lot of that with me in analyzing fiction. And that started with this teacher with Ray Moskowitz. He taught me the importance of contradictions. He taught me to stop desperately searching for an answer and just appreciate the question. Even though what he taught was mostly philosophy and ethics, everything was a subject of analysis for him. There was a time when he would give students rides from school and he would put on the radio and push them to analyze the song lyrics. And one summer he did short story analysis randomly. It was not his field, but that summer really opened up fictional analysis for me in a different way from before. And I still use a lot of the same features of his definition style with these videos. I am grateful that I had the opportunity to share with him a couple months before he died that I had started this channel and I was passing on his ideas and methods to tens of thousands of people. So yeah, people here like to compliment me on how I analyze things, but I can't take credit. I had great teachers and I owe the credit to them. Anyway, thanks Rabbi Moskowitz. Zekhar Sadiq Livraka.